I'm engaged in a bunch of uh, collaborative ventures these days um, that are, are really quite exciting, particularly the ones with graduate students. Um, uh, one idea is, is an interest in uh, the, the consequences of residential disadvantage on kids' uh, educational attainment and cognitive achievement. And uh, we've observed that uh, although this is an, is an old literature, right, the idea that if I live in a bad neighborhood this is bad for me, although this is an old literature, most of this literature has looked at just exposure to bad neighborhoods in, at a point in time. And we make, I think, sort of the obvious observation that um, the longer I'm exposed to residential disadvantage, the worse uh, the, the consequences should be. Now, there are interesting methodological complications here because length of residence in a, um, in a location is, of course, endogenous potentially to the, to the outcome problem. So we try to get, uh, to get around that. And what we find is that sort of uh, growing up in a, in a disadvantaged neighborhood from age one to age 17 has really tremendously large effects both on cognitive um, a test scores and on high school graduation. Um, so that's one idea. The second idea takes this, uh, it takes this point about the duration of exposure to residential disadvantage and if you want sort of potentiates it um, by asking whether there are multi-generational consequences of residential disadvantage. The starting point here is that um, we, we observe that most uh, kids that grow up in disadvantaged neighborhoods today are the children of parents who themselves grew up in very disadvantaged neighborhoods. So the question is what happens to the child outcomes in a family that's been dis exposed to disadvantaged neighborhoods for generations? Um, and you know, as is not entirely surprising, the, the, uh, the best answer that we can give to that is that the effect is very large. Ah, curiosity, uh, a, a deep and abiding interest in the social world, I think, is the, is the most important uh, uh, interest to bring. Um, the, the famous sociologist um, uh, Neil Flickstein once said that uh, one, shouldn't, one really shouldn't enter a graduate program in sociology if one couldn't give, say, five alternative, mutually exclusive explanations for any given correlation. So a certain amount of imagination is required. Then, of course, once once developed that kind of uh, 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 flexibility, the real trick is how do, do we empirically sort through these competing explanations or these competing theories. So I think uh, uh, the second skill that uh, uh, is is important is you know a certain uh, is a certain love for empirical evidence. And in my field, that could be quantitative, which is what what I do. Uh, it could also be entirely qualitative. I think enormously important insights have come out of, uh, out of deep community studies, uh, ethnographies, where uh, sociologists have sort of really embedded themselves in, a, in, say, a disadvantaged neighborhood and observed the social processes by talking to all uh, uh, social actors in the place. And so the sociology is a very heterogeneous discipline. We have, very, uh, uh, we have a, a great number of different methodological approaches, uh, which uh, so far, I, I think, have really worked rather well together. Oh yes, of course it will. The, uh, um, some of the research results that were presented in these two days were really uh, uh, they're fascinating, they're enormously challenging, there are new methodological ideas, uh, there, are, there, there was a bit of science fiction uh, you know, about what may be possible perhaps with a selective breeding and, uh, or genetic engineering in the future with respect to social outcomes. Uh, yeah, I think it's been enormously fruitful. Thank you.